Well, welcome moms. We've definitely got enough moms on here. We're going to start just a few minutes after 10. It's nice to see your faces. Um, you know, you can unmute yourselves anytime you want. You know, it's just if the background noises get too crazy, you know, you mute yourself. But otherwise, you can stay open for discussions. Whatever you're comfortable with is fine with me. Um, I am really excited about getting to visit with you today. I, I do need to tell give you an announcement though, before I forget to do this. <clears throat> we originally had a guest speaker that we had um, talked to about coming and talking with us today, but she had a little kind of family emergency come up and was not able to do that. So we didn't we didn't share that this week, but it will be coming up. And she is one of our moms. She was with us two weeks ago. <clears throat> excuse me she normally cannot attend in person because she lives she and her family live in abu dhabi and what at this time while we're meeting it's um what did she tell me like 10 o'clock in the evening in abu dhabi and it's their sabbath and she is teaching a um a sunday school class an online zoom discussion so she normally can't join us, but two weeks ago she did. And then we chatted afterwards and I told her we would be so interested in hearing about their life there and their adventures and their explorations because they go and visit the other countries around them. And their children have had some pretty interesting experiences. And then she was just talking about life there and how it's so different than what we maybe see in the movies and things like that. So um, I, I hope that I was correct in saying that you mamas would be interested in having her come and talk with us, but I think it'll be really fun. Um, I asked her if she would gather some pictures, some of their family photos as they went to visit Egypt. And uh, I don't remember some of the other countries that they visited there, but also just there in Abu Dhabi, you know, to see what it looks like and what life is like and to hear about that. She also mentioned that in their large villa, that they live in she she and her husband and their nine children live there this villa if i am sharing this correctly i believe she told us and kristen you can correct me if i'm wrong but i believe she said that she has they have 10 bathrooms so that might give you a little bit of an indication of the <clears throat> the, the space that they might have there but she said they got that place because they thought it would be so much fun to invite well-educated heart families that were interested in traveling to that area to come and stay with them. And that would help that trip be more affordable for the families. So what a wonderful, wonderful thing. So Andrea Ray, that is her name. She's on the Facebook group. And she, like I said, she's joined us here as well. But yeah, she's a wonderful, kind, very interesting person. So I'm looking forward to that. I will let you know as soon as we have a date on that. But in the meantime, <clears throat> not sharing too much, too much detail, but she, um, she and her family were, um, they were leaving church a week ago and um, outside in the street, a man was walking across the street, a car came by and hit him car was going really fast and didn't see the man and wasn't able to stop in time. And anyway, she and her 17 year old son witnessed this. And then the little one started coming out. The 17 year old son, very sweet, good boy, didn't want his siblings to see any of this. And so he was taking them around to the back of the building uh, to a parking lot or something like that. I may get some of this wrong, but um, anyway, that 17 year old boy, he fell, he fell I think he fell backwards on his elbows real hard on the concrete and then smacked his head and has a very severe concussion. And so I thought this would be a wonderful group to um, share this story with and ask for your prayers for uh, on behalf of that family and their 17 year old son who needs to recover and um, and be healthy from this um, concussion that he has. So I, I had asked about his name, but I hadn't heard back from her in time. So if you just keep that family, the Ray family, REA family in your prayers and specifically their 17 year old son. And then when that, when life gets back to normal for, um, for Andrea, then she'll come and join us. So there is that. So now moving on, I would love to hear about your past week. I would love to hear any follow-up comments from last week's meeting with Sarah um, anything else that has been on your mind, I want to start with that before we get into the meat of today's um, message. So opening it up to you moms. 
Well, I just want to say that I missed last week and I cannot keep doing that because this has been so healing for me. I can't, I can't be missing meetings. So I'm so happy to be here and it has made such a difference, such a difference. Oh, anyway. You are so, so thank sweet. You. Yeah, uh -huh. you are so sweet. We love having you here. We love the sweet spirit that you bring, Caden. So thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> and I know it takes a while to think about, you know, what thoughts you might've had. Oh, Lindsay. Okay. Go, uh, go Lindsay. One comment that she, or yeah, she made that it just stuck with me and it stuck with me all week. And I even wrote it on our whiteboard in the kitchen so my kids could see it. And she just said, value yourself enough to do the hard work. And that has just stuck with me. And um, I talked to my husband about it and my kids about it. And I just, it has just resonated with me. So I really appreciate that she put that out there because it is, it is hard to, you know, get kids to be self learners. Um, even me as an adult, just trying to push myself to learn more and to become better well read and whatnot. But yeah, I just didn't think about it that way. It's just, this is valuing myself by pushing myself to do things like this. I love that. I love that. That's a good insight. She says lots of good things. <clears throat> I had so much fun spending those days at the beach, just Sarah and me. And we were talking and sharing and I was having her teach me the thing, some of the things that she's learned. So it was really interesting. And the Thai food we got wasn't bad either. <laughs> that was so much fun. I loved it. Okay, any other <clears throat> insights from last week's meetings, any other past meetings, any thoughts about other things that are going on with you right now, things that, that are just kind of rolling around in your head that you're thinking about? I've been thinking about the two podcasts that were shared recently by Brooke Snow. The first one about floors and ceilings and the other one about Say It to Create It. So I listened to both of them and I had some profound realizations. And so I've just been thinking about them a lot and I was able to apply some of it. And I even shared it with my family for the floors and ceilings podcast. My mom listened to it and she called me back in tears, thanking me for sharing it with her. And she said that she wished that she had had that perspective when she was raising her children so it kind of made me sad, but it made me really grateful that she can learn about it now. It's never too late. And for the Say It to Create It, I remember, Lori, that you had summarized it for us. And one thing that you said that I really loved was about the words I am are sacred. And so I really enjoyed that part and how she compared the word to a seed and how Sometimes we feel like we're lying to ourselves when we say these affirmations, but we just have to practice and start it. And so I was able to use it for my son one day that he was very afraid to do something. And I was able to tell him that you are calm and you are brave and you are capable. So I've been thinking about affirmations for myself and for my children and how to build my family up and help them. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I was going to bring Brooke Snow up again, just because I'm learning so much from her. I value these simple truths that somehow I missed or Satan has just been so good at giving me messages. And I've been so, so very diligent about receiving them <laughs> that they have pushed out those more positive, optimistic messages. And so <clears throat> the more I'm shoving out, and saying no to those negative messages. And now I'm receiving so much more light. And I love that. I'm so grateful for that. But yeah, and Brooke's bo uh, book, I've started that. Uh, I think it's, if I am remembering correctly, it's called True Identity. She talks about how we have two identities, our, our true identity, which is uh, which we talk about in the scriptures as divine nature our divine nature. And the second one is the one that um, kind of the, uh, the one that Satan will, will give to us, you know, and try the way that he tries to 
tell us who we are, what we are, you know, or that we're not enough or whatever, those things that we kind of latch onto a little too, a little too strongly and don't let that divine nature come out. And so I, I'm just, I read the first chapter and I'm trying to make myself read slowly and with a pencil and a highlighter and, you know, marking and thinking and soaking it all in. It's, it's very good. For me, it was available through Amazon um, as a free, um, one of those free downloads on my Kindle app. So you might want to check into that. I don't know how long that is. So <clears throat> other thoughts, other things that are just rolling around in your heads? You said slow down and like take the time to mark. I've really, that's been, that's been on my mind lately as I try to study things. It used to be like, okay, let's see how much information I can get in, which I know we don't do for our children, but I would forget and try to do it for myself. Like, okay, I need to hurry up and um, calls coming in. Um, I need to hurry up and read through this book or I need to, you know, get all this information in the rotation this month. Um, like I need to learn all the things. There's so much to learn. But when I slowed down and just thought, you know, it doesn't really matter how many pages I get through. It's just how much gets through me. And so, um, and just, yeah, like paragraph by paragraph and word by word, like really thinking about the things I'm reading, whether that's scriptures or um, like one of the books from the rotation or whatever it is, that's really been helpful for me to just not try to get through it, but get it through me. Right, right. and kind of remembering yeah. um, that it's it really is never too late and we can start where mm -hmm. we are you know, remembering that is it really important. And I wonder if that's more what Kristen does, my sister-in-law, who's working somewhere, but is there, um, is here with us. But um, because she really thinks about, you know, she'll read something or come across something and really think about it and let it kind of percolate in there and, and think about how it applies to her life and what examples she may have seen and and I love that. And I don't do that. I rush through it to try to get as much as I can. Well, how much did I get? I may have read it all, but how much did I actually retain, you know, and how much is really in my heart? So it definitely makes a difference to slow down and take that time to really get that, um, get that into you, whatever it is that you're studying. So one of the things that I definitely want to be part of the message, the underlying message for today is I'm seeing so much more clearly how, how significant it is that you moms are learning for yourself. I watch these, watch, com, watch, how do I watch conversations? I, um, I'm the, the messages, the posts, the comments that are in the well-educated heart online on, on Facebook, you know, as I look at those, I think, oh, there are still so many moms, and, I, I, and I'm saying this in the kindest of ways. I'm not saying this as a harsh, critical judgment, okay? Um, but so many moms that are so worried still about curriculum and finding the right curriculum and figuring that out and getting their schedule right and making sure they check all the boxes. And, and you know, and it's, it's, um, it's what? It's a process, right? Getting from the traditional way of thinking to the heart way of thinking. So it is a process and all of us are on that, you know, spectrum somewhere. So, so not to, not to downplay the, the, the part of progress in that, but, um, but I think, oh, if I could just help you get to this point, you know, where most of you are, where you're starting to really see, oh, it really is about me. It really is about my heart. As I'm working on my heart, as I am, as I'm taking time to read and study and learn and experience and immerse myself, my home, my family in these warm, wonderful things, art and music and um, wonderful stories and being out in nature <clears throat> and the gospel, as these are part of our lives, it just naturally trickles down to our family. It naturally maybe overflows us and they can't help but see it and receive that in their lives. And as I've said, 
homeschooling, private schooling, charter schooling, public schooling, any combination of them, no children at home at all. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're at. You have the power to influence people around you. So you learning on your own is so significant. So don't let any of the outside pressures or voices tell you differently. What you're pursuing right now is of so much value that you may be attacked a little bit um, because there's somebody out there that doesn't want you doing this, doesn't want this kind of progress and doesn't want these kinds of um, influences out there in the world. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah. As I listened to conference last weekend, um, that was one thing that kept like coming up for me was that, yeah, how do we distinguish like what's important for our families and for our lives? Like what has eternal um, consequences versus like what's just important to the world? And it just kept coming back to learn of Christ. If we focus on Christ, if we learn how to be like him, if we just make him our number one priority, then the rest just falls into place. And then we know what it is that we're supposed to be focusing on. Yeah. Just a second. Yeah, I so I think that. that's just like, if we just can center on him, then everything else just makes sense. And like the things we're supposed to do kind of fall into place. Yeah. That is so true. And that really is the heart of all of this. You know, this heart learning is another way really of teaching us how to focus our lives on Christ. It's just another way to say that. And it may be a more approachable way for a lot of people to receive it, <clears throat> but it really is what it's about. Okay, any other thoughts before I move forward? I, it, jump in if you feel like you want to, but I wanna share with you what I got. I got a physical copy, my physical copy of of Opal Whiteley and her journal. And I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And I did find out, you got you, some of you had asked me, she um, spent most of her adult life in England and she died in 1991. So anyway, <clears throat> I love her. I love her. I'm loving her more and more and more as I read more about her. Okay. This is a book I have that I love. I've mentioned it before. It has two different titles. One of them is Highways to Learning. All my books are these used copies I buy somewhere. But the one I love, I must have loaned out and I can't, I can't find it because I never write down who I loan my books out to. But it's a tiny little, it's just beautiful. It's a small, hardbound, dark green little book. And it's called I Love Books. <clears throat> and I love that it's small because it just seems like such a treasure. <clears throat> Anyway, this is Highways to Learning, A Guide Through Bookland by John D. Snyder, and it is lovely, and it just talks about the importance of reading books, and so I wanted to share this with you. I knew that you would love it. I also love, I'm going to take the paper cover off. I also love this inside. I love it. I don't know. Can you see that? <clears throat> I love it. I love these old kind of drawings, you know, it says a man is himself plus the books he reads. And, and then the other quote is without a love for books, the richest man is poor. So I love that. And I had marked a page. Do I know where it is now? Yes. Okay. So I love this. I remember um, reading this book and having this see getting this picture in my head as he was talking. And I thought <clears throat> this, that this was just so beautiful. So I'm going to share this with you. You know I'm a big book lover, so this is this is um, significant to me. Our house is empty, he wrote, save only myself and the rats and mice who nibble in solitary hunger. There is no voice in the hall, no tread on the stairs. The clock has stopped, the pump creaks no more, but I sit here with no company but books, dipping into dainty honeycombs of literature. All minds in the world's history find their focus in a library. This is the pinnacle of the temple from which we may see all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. I keep Egypt and the Holy Land in the closet next to the window. On the side of them are Athens and the empire of Rome. Never was such an army mustered as I have here. No general ever had such soldiers as I. No kingdom ever had half such illustrious subjects as mine or half as well governed. 
I can put my haughtiest subjects up or down as it pleases me. I call Plato and he answers here, a, a noble and sturdy soldier. Aristotle, here, a host in himself. Demosthenes, Cicero, Caesar, Pliny, here they answer and they smile at me in their immortality of youth. But I want you to know I skipped a name that I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> because you can do that. <laughs> Um, modesty all, they never speak unless spoken to, bountiful all, they never refuse to answer, and they are all at peace together. My architects are building night and day without sound of hammer, my painters designing, my poets singing, my philosophers dis discoursing, my historians and theolo theo theolo wait, theologians, right? Is that right? Theologians, weaving their tapestries, my generals marching about without noise or blood. Anyway, it goes on, but it just paints this picture of what you have if you have a library of books, you know, and I, I love that. I think that's really fun. Are you beginning to surround yourself with books? All of you, I know Linnell has. We heard about Linnell's, you know, absence of books and now she's been collecting and collecting and adding to her library. I know Lindsay Bunting has them because I've speaking seen of, her library. Yeah, speaking of collecting, how do I turn this around? I always fell into the trap of the Barnes and Noble sale this this um week yes. and look at them all they're so pretty but I found some on ours here in town and then um when I went over to the coast this week we've walked oh. by Barnes and Noble so I found yes. five more <laughs> I love it I love it I love it okay now do I know how to I was going to take you oh do I know how to join my own meeting can I join my own meeting? I think I can. Um, sorry, girls, hang on one sec. I don't know if I can, if I'll show up on here. Yes, okay. Yes. Sorry for the noise. I'm gonna take you away. Oh, let's see. All right, I'm gonna take you somewhere. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me? Any of you? Can you? Um, I'm trying to see if I can turn this around. Yes. I'm just gonna have to, yeah, you can hear me. Okay, so I just have to turn you here because I can't do it the other way. Okay, so we're in my library. So this is my dining room, but um, we turned it into a library because, because why not? Why would you not? That is beautiful. So this, is my, this is my library. And this is where we can come and hide out um, and read. So, okay, so now we're gonna go back. <sighs> okay. So we're going back upstairs and I'll tell you in a moment why I did that. And hopefully I'll be able to end this. Okay. okay. Now no, I, I did, did that for a reason. reason. I don't know if I can. All right, I wanted you to see. Sorry, I just threw the other one out because I don't know how to stop it. I have to wait till Michael comes upstairs, but at least it's out of the room. So early, early on, I wanted a library. I wanted books. I love books. And I wanted to have a stash of them in my home for my children. That was important to me. And so I... I kind of made that a goal, but I didn't have a lot of money to do that. And so I prayed about that and um, asked Heavenly Father to help me to be able to build up my library. And I purchased very few of the books on those shelves, very few of them, probably, oh goodness. I mean, not even 10% of them. Um, so they were, they just became available to me through all kinds of sources. And even the ones I did purchase, I purchased most of them 
at thrift stores or library book sales or um, or uh, where else, Lindsay? I don't know. Anyway, but just inexpensive, maybe online used copies, things like that. And then I invited all of my friends, anybody who would listen <laughs> to do the same. And so I think that's how Lindsay got started. She started going to um, library book sales too um, with me and some of my other friends. But whatever it is, maybe yours is craft supplies, art supplies. Maybe it's um, like hiking, backpacking stuff to get, take your family outside, um, whatever it is that you have a passion about that you'd like to share with your children or provide for your children, start seeking those things, you know, invite those into your life and they'll, they'll just start coming. You'll find them just start appearing. And I can't hear you, Lori. Am I the only one? Oh, really? I can hear you. You can hear me, Linnell? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Something on your side. Um, I think. Okay, Kristen, were you coming on to share? I was just coming to say that I can hear you too. Oh, okay. Okay, Lindsay uh, Bunting, I'm going to turn it over to you for a moment because I'm going to run that other phone downstairs and have Michael stop that for me because I, I, I hear a bit of an echo and I apologize, you guys. I thought I knew what I was doing, obviously. I still don't, but that's all right. <laughs> okay. It was glitching for me. I don't know if that was just me or if it was everybody. I don't know. So as I walked back to my hallway, I kind of missed some stuff, but I heard her talk about just finding things, finding books, being on the hunt for cheap books. And that's how I've gotten most of my books, just library bookshelves. <laughs> Thanks to Lori. She'd even like wait for me. She'd like go and make a stack for me and be like, hey, these are for you. You need to buy these. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> okay so yeah that's the pushy part of me <laughs> that tells my friends what to do okay this is what you have to do <laughs> but it turned out okay <sighs> oh and uh, like i've said before as i've as i've become older i'm less pushy just because i'm i don't have the energy so i'm sure all my friends are grateful <laughs> oh good she's getting older okay um i needed you to be pushy sounds great for me <laughs> Oh, you're nice. Okay. So invite it into your life, whatever it is that you feel like, oh, I really feel like I need to do this with my children or something, you know, um, Brooke Snow, just in a podcast I was just listening to this morning, the most recent one, she was talking about how Heavenly Father plants desires in our hearts and those desires help direct us to what it is that we, that kind of is our calling, you know, what it is that we should be doing. And so don't see those as like this, oh, this is just what I want. No, explore those. Talk to Heavenly Father about those and say, is this something that I can be doing? Sometimes we don't give ourselves permission to do something because we love it. And so we think, well, I don't get to do something I love, you know, <laughs> well, why not? I used to think that way too, you know, I don't know, life's supposed to be hard and it's supposed, and it, and it is full of trials and things like that. But, um, but I think that a loving parent would like his children to be happy and to enjoy um, what they can of their life experience, you know, the experience that is filled with trials and difficulties and things as well, because those help us to grow but also he provides some sunshine and flowers and, and those come in lots of different ways in our lives. So, so explore that, explore the things that you're kind of just feeling in your heart. Well, I really, I love this. I'd love to explore this a little bit more. You might not even see a connection to your children necessarily or to your circle of influence, but if you explore it and if the spirit kind of nods and says, yes, this is good, this is right, it, just because you can't see the potential influence of that thing doesn't mean that there isn't an influence that will be great if you follow that, you know. So I think a lot of the people that are doing good things right now, think Marlene Peterson, were started with a desire. You know, she's not a person who didn't already love these things that she's been learning about and exploring. Those were, that was a desire that was planted in her heart. And then she has been definitely, you know, used as a vehicle to do so much good work through these natural desires of hers. 
So any thoughts on that? Well, I know I've had the desire and Lindsay Watkins has shared her daughter's desire to like teach these things to other people and have well-educated heart schools. So I think I've like had that put into my heart um, and I don't know the details of like when or how it'll happen, but um, like the idea of creating a place for well-educated heart families to come and to experience that. And like the family that you're talking about in Abu Dhabi, like that's what they've wanted to do. And they created a space for people to come and to share this way of learning. So I think that's also being planted in our hearts as we learn about the well-educated heart way of learning to, to show it to people. No, no. Yeah, I love that. And I'm excited to see how that all evolves, you know, as you move forward uh, on that path that you're being directed on. Uh, that's exciting. You know, and you have a great opportunity also, all of you women, to nurture the hearts of children, young adults around you. And I've mentioned that before, but there's such a need for that. You know, this world that got ugly really fast <laughs> and that is very loud in all of that ugliness. Uh, there are a lot of young people out there who need soft, kind, warm, loving, open women in their lives to help them. Those mother figures to help them navigate what's going on around them, to help them see that just because there's a, you know, this picture painted right in front of their faces of all this ugliness doesn't mean that that's what the whole, whole world looks like because it does not. I love the imagery of, you know, you're looking through, uh, what are they called in the fence? I like a knot hole, is that what they're called? You know, but you know, a little hole in the fence, right? And you're just looking through that little hole and you're seeing what you can see through that little hole. That's what media does. That's what social media does. That's what, you know, so you're seeing this little tiny picture of it, even movies and things, you are not getting the whole picture, you know, get a, get a stool, get a bucket, get a, somebody to kneel down and climb on their back and peek over that fence and see the whole thing, the whole view. You, in, you can invite those around you to do that. You do that by warming your own heart and having that overflow and you share that with those around you. It is so simple that it doesn't seem possible. It, you know, you just, you think there's no way that that doesn't, can't make that much of a difference. It just can't. Yes. Oh no, no hand raising. You just were playing. <laughs> no, oh, very clever. I didn't even know that one existed. <laughs> well, this to go to, the, to the chat. I don't even know how I'm touching these things. <laughs> there we go. I made it go away. Sorry. Lindsay's showing us all the different reactions we can use while we're chatting together. That's so nice of you. Thank you. Um, that does make me curious. I don't even know. I can't find mine now. But oh goodness. Okay. Sorry. So, do any of you, while I'm messing around with my screen here, that I've messed up here. Do any of you have any thoughts or comments about this, about what we've been talking about? I had a thought this week. Um, I was with a friend who's very successful in her um, in her field, and um, she like she's just really good at what she does. So it got me thinking, what do I like, what is my thing? Like, what do I want to be really, really good at? And like, what is my mission in this life to be like good at? And all I, I mean, like all I ever think about is I just want to be a really good mom. Like, that's my, that's my thing. Like, <laughs> to be a really good mom. And then I just started, and I love that. Like, that's what I, that brings me joy. I love it. But I started thinking, what if I didn't have kids? Like, how could I be a really good mom? Like, and what happens when my kids move out of the house? How am I going to continue that mission to be a really good mom and like you've been talking about we can be mothers to everybody around us and every oh, I, oh, I was listening to the podcast with uh, Marlene was talking about Helen Hunt Jackson and she had a quote that I'm going to butcher that was something like if you don't see your own child's face in every child like 
you're not truly a mother or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it was so interesting to think like that we're, I don't know. Anyway, those are my thoughts, whether they make sense or not. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, moms, we can, we do a good job of interpreting, right? We can read mom or whatever, decipher mom language. Any other thoughts? Okay, I'm going to share with you something else I brought. This is one of a little trilogy of books. And I started out one time, I found I found this one in a different format, but um, A Child's History of the World. Some of you as homeschoolers may be familiar with it. It's a book that was written by, um, oh, now what is his name? Hillier, James Hillier, is that what his name is? Um, and um, it, he was the headmaster at at uh, the Calvert School back in Baltimore, Maryland, I think. Anyway, he wrote this book as a way for the children in his school to access geography. He also wrote, I mean, history. He also wrote A Child's History of Geography and A Child's History of Art. And I, my mom found the three volume set for me. So I have all three of them in my library and I love them. I love this book. This is an example of a heart book. And I want to share it with you because this month's Mother's University topic is history. So um, let me, and I, I've shared this with so many moms. This is one of the books that is part of my introduction. If moms come, uh, we have a habit of mentoring moms in my house, in my library. My kids would play with the, the kids, the children that the moms would bring. And then the mom and I would sit in my library and we would chat. And so, I'm going to tell you about this lovely book, if I can get to it. All right. So it says, a child's history of the world begins here. And I just, I like, I love how it's all set up. So here we go. We have a little bit of story time. So hopefully you have a few minutes. Once upon a time, there was a boy just like me. He had to stay in bed in the morning until seven o'clock until his father and mother were ready to get up. So did I. As he was always awake long before this time, he used to lie there and think about all sorts of curious things. So did I. One thing he used to wonder was this, what would the world be like if there were no fathers and mothers, no uncles and aunts, no cousins or other children to play with, no people at all except himself in the whole world? Perhaps you have wondered the same thing. So did I. At last, he used to get so lonely just from thinking how dreadful such a world would be that he could stand it no longer and would run to his mother's room and jump into bed by her side just to get this terrible thought out of his mind. So did I, for I was the boy. Well, there was a time long, long, long ago when there were no men or women or children, no people of any kind in the whole world. Of course, there were no houses, for there was no one to build them or to live in them no towns or cities, nothing that people make. There were just wild animals, bears and wolves, birds and butterflies, frogs and snakes, turtles and fish. Can you think of such a world as that? Then long, long, long before that, there was a time when there were no people and no animals of any sort in the whole world. There were just growing plants, trees and bushes, grass and flowers. Can you think of such a world as that? Then, long, 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 long before that, there was a time when there were no people, no animals, no plants in the whole world. There was just bare rock and water everywhere. Can you think of such a world as that? Then, long, 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 you might keep on saying long, 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 all day and tomorrow, and all next week, and next month, and next year, and it would not be long enough before this. There was a time when there was no world at all. There were only the stars, nothing else. Now, real stars are not things with points like those in the corner of a flag, or the gold ones you put on a Christmas tree. The real stars in the sky have no points. They are huge burning coals of fire. Coals of fire. Each star, however, is so huge that there's nothing in the world now anywhere nearly as big. Anyway, it goes on. And it goes on and talks about how our world first started, you know, before everything. And it talks about, at first, however, our world or earth was nothing but a ball of rock. 
This ball of rock was wrapped around with steam like a heavy fog. Then the steam turned to rain and it rained on the world. Now, I know I've told this to Lindsay. I know I've shared this with Kristen. I probably have shared it with Amy. I haven't had a chance to share it with Lori yet, but this is something that like my friends I've met with in person, I've shared this story because I love it. I love this because he says it, it, it's even printed on the page and it rained and it rained and it rained. Do you see that? How the words come down in the, like the rain. I love that. Until it filled up the hollows and made enormously big puddles. These puddles were the oceans. The dry places were bare rock. Then, it, then after this came the first living things. And let's see if I can get this on the camera. Oh, the first living things, tiny plants. It says right there that you can only see under a microscope. And then it talks about the stair step, about how the, you know, and he writes it as a stair step, this progression. Anyway, the book is charming. The geography book is funny because they've never been to the moon. They talk about, oh, what would that be like? You know, but that's kind of fun because you could read it to your children and talk about there was a time when children like you and me, you know, we didn't know, they didn't know that people were ever going to be able to go to the moon. You know, so anyway, I love that style of writing. Um, that style of writing doesn't only appeal to children. It appears appeals to big children who just haven't grown up, you know, which I think is actually a really good thing. Um, but these are things you can read. You don't have to be overwhelmed by, oh, I'm supposed to learn. I'm supposed to study. I'm supposed to do all these things. And, oh, I don't, I, I'm, I don't even know where to start. And what if I don't understand the books? Read children's books. Read children's books. You know, um, somebody, does somebody know the quote by C.S. Lewis that talks about children's books? You know, if it's not good enough to be interesting to an adult you know it's not worth ida are you on yes i'm on that was oh that was what you said i was just gonna say i know what that is <laughs> say no say it again no it's just that he said if it's not interesting if a children's book isn't interesting for an adult to read then it's not worth reading you should throw it out and i always thought that was so great i'm like yeah because there's so many little kids books that i'm like oh my gosh do i have to read this to my kids again <laughs> Yeah. So now I throw them out. I don't even yeah. feel bad anymore. Yeah. Yep, me too. My picture books are fabulous picture books. If you ever want recommendations on picture books, man, I can give them to you because I love picture books. I, I was the story time lady, self, self uh, invited <laughs> story time lady in our local library for a while because the one they had was doing a horrible job. And there were like three kids that were going. And I thought that was super sad because when my kids were that age, we had a bunch of kids and we all enjoyed it. So I said, hey, um, I know you've got a ton of things to do. So maybe would you want somebody to volunteer to do the story time? <laughs> And you're doing a bad job. So um, you need somebody to replace you. So I started doing story time. I had a blast picking out the picture books that were actually worth reading and worth sharing with the kids. And anyway, it was super fun. So yes, I'm not an expert on children's literature, but I am a mom and I know good books. So I can share them. Have that list somewhere. I mean, feel free to share it. Oh, what? Say that again. If you have that list of children's books. Oh, I can make share. a list. Yeah, I'll make a list. Lindsay Bunting, okay. please remind me. <laughs> remind me, okay. remind me. But yes, yes. Like, for example, moms, do you know King Bid Goods in the Bathtub? Do you know that one? That's a Dan and Audrey Wood book. Oh, my goodness. I love that book. King Bid, King Bid Goods in the Bathtub, and he won't get out. And so all the different people in his court come in and try to help convince the king to get out of the bathtub because he, you know, he needs to go and be a king. So all these different people come in and they try different methods to get him to come out of the bathtub. Lindsay Bunting, what's one of the things that they try to use to entice him out of the bathtub? Wow, I'm pulling it off the shelf right now because it's one of our favorites. I'm like pulling all these books off, like, oh, the story of children's history of the world. I forgot about that one. They like, entice him with lunch and he's like no today we lunch in the tub and they like eat this big feast in the tub and it's like but what about the ball and yeah they're trying to get him to come out and he's like no let's fish in the tub and it's adorable it's our favorite and at the end you see his little 
tushy. So, you know, or he, you don't actually see it, but he jumps out like, you know, with a towel around him like, oh, because they pulled yeah, the plug so, on him. So Ruby, my kids love Ruby? that part. Where's Ruby? Is Ruby still close by? Yeah. Okay, Ruby, come here for a second, sweetie. Well, and she can't hear you because I got you in my ear. Oh, oh, like, oh. Yeah. Let's hey, see Ruby. if that works. Ruby, sweetheart, can you do me a favor? There we go. What? I was telling all these moms about King Bid Goods in the Bathtub, which is one of my favorite books. Is it one of your favorite books? Do you like that one? Yeah. So yeah. can you tell the moms how they finally, who it was, who was smart enough to figure out how to get the king out of the bathtub and how did he get him out? Do you remember how to get was him it, out? Was it one of the adults or was it one of the kids? Um, one of the kids. Uh huh. And how did he get him out of the bathtub? What did he do? Unplug the bath. He pulled the plug, right? He pulled the plug so that all the water drained out of the bathtub and the king had to hurry up and get out, right? Do you like that one? Do you like the pictures? You like the pictures? They're funny. I do too. I like that one. Thank you, Ruby. I appreciate that, sweetheart. Okay, that one is so much fun. I love that book. Dawn and Audrey Wood, they're the ones that wrote The Napping House. Mo most people are familiar with The Napping House. Wait, is that what it's called? Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm still unmuted. I'm like nodding my head. Yes. Also, Heckety Peg. If you haven't read Heckety Peg, you have to get that one. And Silly Sally, the one Silly Sally, Silly goes Sally. Out inside out. Yes. Or whatever. I don't know. Ruby has that one memorized. If you'd like her just to like read the whole book off the top of her head right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have her come over and do that. I love for that. real. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're gonna be so sick of my kids. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna take you out of my ear. Not possible. Over. All these ginger babies. <laughs> yeah, Ruby, can you tell them without the book? Can you just tell them the story of Silly Sally? Silly Sally went to town dancing backwards upside down on the wood. Um, Silly Sally went to town um, walking backwards upside down. On the way, Oops. she met a pig, um, a silly pig at dance jig. Silly Sally went to town dancing backwards up dancing backwards upside down. On the way they met a dog. A silly dog at play leapfrog. Silly Sally went to town leaping backwards upside down. On the way they met a loom, a silly loom at sung a tune. Silly Sally went to town singing backwards upside down. On the way they met a sheep, a silly sheep at fell asleep. Silly Sally went to town sleeping backwards upside down. Now how does so Silly Sally went to go to How does she get to town? Sleeping. Backwards upside down. On the way nearly, nearly buttercup. She took Called the pig up, up, up. Dance to the jig. She tickled the dog at play late frog. She tickled the loon that sang a tune. She tickled the sheep at fell asleep. She, um, she tickled Silly Sally and Silly Sally. Woke right up. Roll, roll right up and silly sally tickled nearly buttercup and that's how they got to town walking backwards upside down great great job ruby great job. Thank you. that's your favorite so as soon as you said it i had to <laughs> <laughs> now that that little child that just recited that whole book for you grows up in this house where they don't do school they do the unschooling, let your child direct the learning. Lindsay, how dare you not work on that checklist of things to cross off? That's just embarrassing. <laughs> I'm not taking away from that because if that, you, so, some of us are so different, we need structure and some of us need no structure and some of us need something in between. We're all different. We all have to do what works for us and our family. I just want to highlight that without that structure, children still want to learn things. 
They love to learn things. If you let them go and trust in them to do it, they will. They will. They will. We're getting thumbs up from Ida all over the place. So we know we're on track. Okay. So children's books. Amazing. Wonderful. Here's another uh, husband, wife. I think they're husband, wife. You know, they are. I'm pretty sure. You know, Charles and Mary Lamb, who wrote uh, Tales of Tales from Shakespeare. Tales. It's like a storytelling version of the Shakespeare plays. But Charles and Mary Lamb are brother and sister. This, I think, is husband and wife, right? The Delairs. So this, I'm pretty sure. Anyway. They wrote a bunch of books and they're just wonderful, wonderful, lovely books that tell lots of different stories. And we have a lot of them. And this one is on Abraham Lincoln. Now I want you moms to know this month in Well-Educated Heart, if you're following the rotation, Abraham Lincoln is on the rotation. This is your chance to get to know this amazing, incredible, wonderful man who I love. Now the books, the study, everything, the rotation about Abraham Lincoln, that is for you. You can share it with your kids if you want, but it's for you. You're the ones who are supposed to be doing the work and reading and learning about Abraham Lincoln this work, this work, this month. You're the ones that are supposed to be filling your heart with history and finding out why history is so wonderful. If you grew up like I did and you had a school experience like I did, you didn't like history. I didn't love history. I was, I still, because I read a bunch, I enjoyed learning about things that I learned about but not the things that were presented to me in school. That was my, my response. And I was a really good student, really good student. I graduated a year early. I was just bored and done. Um, uh, but I wasn't interested in the way that it was presented to me at that time, way back when. Now, I don't know about your experiences, but I know that for my children, as they went through and learned history, they learned history by walking in people's shoes, by learning about individual people during a time period and seeing what life was like and learning to care about what was going on because it mattered to people right? It became a personal thing. So history can be absolutely wonderful, exciting, and fun. And I'm trying to find a book. Um, or it can be really boring and dry. Oh, I didn't even bring it. How silly. Okay. So Marlene's book, the history book for, oh no, I did. It's right in front of me. Huh, huh. So this one, the mother's, um, mother's heart learning library. And this is the one on history for this month. It's online, right? It's online, but I, I want to mark mine up and everything. The very beginning of it, they're all just quotes from what Marlene calls the heart specialists, you know, those writers that know what it is to, to reach our hearts. All these quotes about history and what it should be and why it's important and why we need it. And it's absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, Oh, I want to see. Um, into, into the field of science, we trace the book influence. The 12-year-old Huxley. So this is, what's his first name? Do you guys remember? I don't remember. No, he's a writer. Anyway, he um, lighted his candle before daylight with a, and with a blanket pinned about his shoulders, read Hutton's geology. One of his boyish speculations, says his son, was as to what would become of things if their qualities were taken away. And lighting upon Sir William Hamilton's logic, he devoured it to such good effect that when years afterwards he came to tackle the great philosophers, especially the English and German, he found he had already a clear notion of where the key of metaphysics lay. Uh, you know, this is just a childhood's reading because this kid was interested. He was enthusiastic about a subject. Our kids are going to do that. They're going to flock to what they're interested in. Aldous, thank you. Aldous Huxley, yes, thank you. Um, it is not possible to, oh, sorry, that's not the part I wanted to read. Um, okay, this is the part I wanted to read. This is this guy, Abraham Lincoln. Um, we, blah, 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 blah. Let's get a glimpse of young Abe Lincoln stretched out on the cabin floor, reading by the light of a burning log, those precious books to borrow which he had tramped many a mile. He learned Burns by heart and Shakespeare too, a significant fact when we consider the depth and breadth of Shakespeare's humanity, and that Burns sang the Brotherhood of Man. 
Thus, we find that the past presents an overwhelming and convincing mass of proof as to the influence of books. We find many men and women deeply moved and impelled by what they read, strong, virile literature capable of impressing the imagination, which is what we talked about last month. And what is of educational importance? We note that many of these books were read, appreciated, and there are content, contents absorbed by the very young. So we're not talking about adults reading this stuff. We're talking about kids reading it. And that's, those are the ones that had this huge influence on. And they went on to live rich lives or become great contributors to the world. Books are key. They're so important. So you mamas read these books. So this is a good one on Abraham Lincoln. This is a wonderful one that I forgot I had in my bookshelf. It's an old one. Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln blah, friend of the people. Clara Ingram Judson. And this one is, um, it's wonderful. It's super interesting. In this book are pictures of these dioramas that are somewhere in a, you know, back in Kentucky in a historical place, you know, that you can go visit and learn about Lincoln. And there are these dioramas. Kristen might know because she's gone to visit this, I think. I think that she went with her family to go um, to Springfield or something and see some of this stuff. But anyway, um, there are these, this huge diorama that was constructed. Um, Kristen, you're there. Is that what, did you, have you been to that place where those Lincoln dioramas are? No, you have not. The Chicago Historical Society and their part, they were made by the museum extension program. Anyway, and it, it talked about all the adults that were involved in making this and um, more, it says more than 10,000 figures were cast, 6,000 of them were used, and icicles that were used in the diorama were made of blown glass, books are made out of little sections of a telephone book that then were bound. And anyway, it's just kind of fascinating, but it, we talk about um, so there's that. There's also, you could get, Charles Sandberg is supposed to be the greatest writer on Abraham Lincoln. And there's a series of books on Abraham Lincoln. And this one I picked up at a library book sale. I don't have the full set. I would love that someday, but I need to read the first one before I, before I get to do that. <laughs> and there's another one. There are so many books on Lincoln because so many people, as they've started to learn about him, have fallen in love with him. The writer of that wonderful, this wonderful children's book on Abraham Lincoln said she re read 200 books and studied countless scores of others as she was preparing and writing this book. So, so moms, the learning is for you. And if it trickles down to your kids, then great. That's wonderful. But the learning is for you. So what are you learning? What are you reading about? Oh, Ida. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not paying attention to the hands. Ida, you rose your hand and I think uh, Laura did too. Sorry. No, um, I'm sorry. I loved what Lindsay was saying earlier. She said, you know, to not worry so much about like how much she's reading, but like that she's getting it. I can't remember how she said it, but like that she's getting the reading into her instead of just, you know, checking off a box kind of. Yeah. And that was really good for me to hear because I try to like rush I'm like oh there's so much to do I just need to go 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 right and then I also love like well, we've been listening to there's in the Bellamont there's a book that um about Abraham Lincoln that Colleen yes. read you know is yeah is the book whatever, recorded anyways anyways that one's really cool and then there's another book that she links in the on the landing page about Abraham Lincoln and we were, I was reading that to the kids and then we listened to the first chapter that Marlene recorded and it was really interesting because I was listening to the kids and and the the book that we that was linked in there that's like on digital archives it had um it talked about Abraham Lincoln's parents you know and his father a lot and it was really super negative about his dad and I, I guess he's portrayed really negatively in history, like that he was lazy and kind of good for nothing. And, and honestly, I don't really didn't, I've never really studied about Abraham Lincoln myself. So my impression of him was that he's like dry and boring and <laughs> which is so sad because I've been reading about him. I'm like, wow, he was really kind of a cool, really super cool guy. 
anyways so i've been loving learning about him but then this book that marlene recorded um did an audio recording of uh it, it gives a totally different perspective about his dad which i thought was really fascinating because and then i t- was talking to the kids i'm like that's why it's so important to like that we read wide and deep because there's a lot of you know people that sometimes are portrayed in certain ways or we might just have an impression of who they are but hearing different people's perspectives and like so abraham lincoln's dad they say is lazy but then in this book that she recorded talks about how he was five years old he was like the youngest of six or something and his dad was killed when he was five and then his all of his siblings and had to work really really hard to take care of the family and and, and he did do lots of things. So, so it highlights though some of the things. So they say, well, maybe he was lazy, but also he did this and this and this. And I was just like, you know what? That's such a good example of why, you know, like you, you should read, you know, different yes. perspectives. So yes, anyways. super interesting. In fact, in this book that I was sharing, I'm so glad you brought this up, Ida, because that's an important thing to remember about history. Um, authentic history you know history as it exists in our past is a true story right but history as it is recorded by men is biased correct all history that is recorded is going to be biased by the person who wrote it bill bennett who wrote um those wonderful books that i have mentioned before that are if you want a wonderful history education they're so good to read america the last best hope which is a phrase that Lincoln used to describe America. But Bill Bennett chose that to be the title of his books. There are three volumes. And, um, but the third volume, Bill Bennett would not write for the longest time because he said I, that was the time period that I lived in. And I worked with these people. I, you know, I knew them. I can't write about them and write objectively about them. And finally, people convinced him and enough years passed that he felt like he might be able to write more objectively about that time period. But in this book, it talks about how so many of the writings um, of Abraham Lincoln were written during the time period or shortly thereafter when he lived. And so it said, you know, that those were troubled years and every person had his own bias. People spoke passionately for or against expressing their own ideas as well as Lincoln's. Well, of course that happened. So now she's the author is saying now that there's it's been nearly a century, a vast body of letters and papers and things are available for study. We've got so much more information at our fingertips. And she said several long cherished myths vanished under the light of current studies. So, and part of that was about his father. So I thought that was really interesting. Hopefully somebody else did too. Sorry. No, that's super cool. That's what I thought too. I was like, that is amazing. How interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then Kristen, I know you came on to address something earlier. Sorry. Oh no, I came on just to answer your question and I nodded my head and that worked. So um so but what you with what you were saying right now um so our family has been three different times i think to the lincoln library in springfield illinois the lincoln library and the museum there and if you ever 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 can go it is so amazing but one of the things that that as you walk through it's kind of an immersive experience and as you walk through there's this room that you go into and it's kind of wallpapered with headlines from the time and they're all negative and and because um just to kind of give you the immersive experience you know they're all blown up really big and they're they're skewed the shapes they're in are not squares they're skewed in different shape maybe i'm imagining that part actually but you felt that <laughs> but you felt it and then you hear these voices that sound like modern day news casters who are with their derisive tones saying these things and they're all negative about Abraham Lincoln. Everything that was published about him. I'm, I shouldn't say everything that was published. Everything in that room is all the negative things that were published about him. And, and you just, you hear it and you read them as you're walking through. And it was such a lesson to me in, we, we can't trust for good or bad, everything we read because, and, and some of what we're reading with our kids today, I mean, like Lori was just pointing out, we're going to read things from the past that, that, that are skewed one way or the other. And so it really, um, it really is a good lesson in, we cannot trust 
everything we read or see or hear and getting as big of a picture as we can. And you know, you hear so much bad about Mary Todd Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really want to learn more about her. That's kind of one on my bucket list things that I haven't gotten to yet is really studying her. Um, because one of the times that we went to the Lincoln Library, we also went to the, there's a national monument there. I, I don't know what, it, it's a national park. Is, it might be a national park, but it's the actual Lincoln home and you can tour the Lincoln home. And as we were touring the Lincoln home this one time, um, it talked about, or the, one, the guide told us that Mary Todd Lincoln got migraine headaches and that she would have them for days. Well, I get migraines and yeah. they, I will, they will last for days. I just am now on, I just have had a migraine for the last week. And today is kind of my first day out of it. And I gained a real appreciation for it. And I thought, okay, how much of what people said about her was that she was in bed with headaches and, and even when she wasn't having him, I mean, it can be, I've had to fight depression sometimes when they've gotten really bad. And, um, did she have that? And, and like, um, there's a place in the museum where you go through and it shows his law office and it has little, um, figures of his children coming and throwing ink at each other and stuff. And, and, and Lincoln was kind of, um, ridiculed or criticized that he would take his kids to work and that he wouldn't that he wouldn't um discipline his children but yet if he had a wife at home with a migraine and he doesn't know what to do and he's got a law office and I just gained from that one little thing I learned about her and my own experience I was able to look at a lot of things in their life and say hmm maybe the things that have been said critically of them were they're coping with something that nobody else understood that was criticizing them. Anyway, so I just, I love the Lincolns and, and have done some studying. And because we've had that experience of going to the Lincoln Library and which once again, please, please go. If you can ever go, it's two and a half hours from Nauvoo. So if anybody's planning a trip to Nauvoo, put that into, because truly, it, I have felt the spirit more there than any place else outside of church things. Um, that it, I just, I love that place. So anyway, that's my little pitch. Good. Thank you. That's what I was hoping for. Thanks for sharing that, Kristen. Yeah. Kristen always has amazing, wonderful things to share. I love her thoughts on things. Now, um, other thoughts on Lincoln, on history, on learning. Um, There's so much out there. Again, I want to stress the learning is for you moms. You're the ones that are supposed to be reading the books, learning the stuff. And then if it trickles down to your kids, great. But if not, that's all right, because it is building you, helping you to be more of who you're supposed to be. Great books that count in the history category. Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, so beautiful, such perspective. You think you have problems. You think life is hard. You read this book. It gives you eternal perspective, not just eternal perspective, but perspective forever and ever. Like you can't really lose that perspective. Such a good book. You just want to learn about stuff and you don't want it to tax your brain too much. That's me. So I read children's books, like I said. So Archimedes and the Dwarf Science, so much fun. This one, one of the stories from here I shared on my very, very, very first time that I, when I was the guest speaker on that Southern California homeschool thing, um, I shared a story from this book. So much fun to learn about science through the actual scientists. You know, what it was they were doing in their life when they discovered the really cool principle that they discovered. So I love it. It's so good. So you learn about levers. You want to teach your kids about levers. Don't just teach them about levers and how they work. I mean, that's cool because it's actually, you can, you know, um, have them do real, real experiments like out in the yard and stuff, things that matter like a teeter totter or something, but you teach them how it was discovered, you know, how that came to be way more interesting or the, this one, the, um, What's it called about the screw, you know, a screw and how that works, you know, when it's drilling down, you know, and pulling stuff up anyway, super interesting. Um, and maybe I'm just 
kind of a nerd and I like really interesting things. But the thing is, we all would be fascinated by any subject if it was presented in a rich, warm, heart-based way, right? And then these, do you guys have these? Mathematicians or people too? They're so good, interesting. You think math is boring. Math is not boring. I mean, maybe actually sitting down and doing it, but reading about the mathematicians and about their lives. And again, how, you know, what they were doing when they, when they learned about whatever they learned about, really fun. So find some good books, find some things that you are interested in learning about and learn about them. Pick up a new hobby and do that with your kids. Like we've heard from Ida about her painting. You know, and it's funny because when she first came on, she was talking about how she loved to paint and, but she would get frustrated. She'd get her paints out. The kids would get into them. Um, and it would just, it was chaos and she just gave up on it. And now uh, if you were here just a couple of weeks ago, when she was talking about that again, <laughs> totally different, total shift. And she gets everything out and they all do it together. So I love it. I should add, Lori, that it's a, <clears throat> I mean, it's still a process. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit of chaos, a little bit of mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What else? What do you want to share? I want to share. Okay, good. Welcome. Good to see your face. Thanks. Thank you. Um. I love music, as you all know, if, if you know me. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. And speaking of which, I listened to that celloist and I listened to him all morning long that you posted <laughs> about this morning. That is beautiful. It's now on my playlist. So thank you. Yep. That's me. just Stephen Sharp Nelson. And he's one of the piano guys, too. So, uh, yeah, he's got some really good albums, just solo albums that he does himself, too, which are so beautiful. Oh, but, so good. Anyway, sorry. It's okay. Um, I love this book. I love learning the history of songs yes. and composers. Yes. This is I'm the spiritual lives of great composers and a composer. I just absolutely love. And he's highlighted in the rotation for this month, his, uh, new world symphony Dvorak. Yes. I love him so, I so much. What needs to happen, I think, um... So I have a little quote from this book that he said, he said, I study with the birds, flowers, God, and myself. And if you listen to his music, you can, I feel like I can hear that. Like I can oh. feel that he loved God and he loved nature. Like there's a song called the song to the moon. And it is one of my favorites. I could listen to it again and again. And you have to listen to it with headphones because you hear it so much better. You just go outside, look at the moon and listen to that song. Anyway, he is fantastic. So tell me yeah. the name again of the moon song because I haven't listened to that one. I don't know that one. I'll, and that's Dvorak too? Yeah, I'll just post a, a link to okay. it. Okay, thank you. And but, also, will you yeah. share that celloist too? Oh yeah, sure. Because he, Definitely. in fact, New World Symphony came up too as part of that playlist. Uh -huh. yep. oh, oh, I love that song. Yep. That was actually, that's one of my, my daughter's favorites. And we just played it all the time. And my grandma had it sung at her funeral. So she really wanted that song. That was one of her favorites. So I love that song. But anyway, I'll leave those links and I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Don't stop talking. <laughs> Okay, I don't know how many of you um, saw, I posted a little video of my son playing the piano because he was just sitting in there messing around playing his little jazz pieces. And I thought, I love this so much. I love that um, he's learning. I love that he is getting better and he's learning so much more. I just love hearing the music. And um, I, I, um encourage your kids, you know, and praise your kids as they're starting to pursue things they're interested in. Don't be afraid. And I want to tell you that that kid, he only had a couple years of actual piano lessons. Um, and then it's all been on his own. Cause he just, we didn't, 
have access. Our piano, one of our piano teachers passed away and then another one moved away. So we didn't have access to one. So all the rest of it, he taught himself, but that kid started out being absolutely obsessed with Minecraft. He had a YouTube channel as a little kid. We gave him very strict, you know, um, I can't think of, but anyway, borders, and that's not the right word, but anyway, boundaries and set all that up for him. But he was learning about Minecraft. He was, um, whatever you like, what do you do? And you're like a podcast or not a podcast, but anyway, you're, he's recording these things about Minecraft and showing, yeah, parameters. Thank you. Um, and he's sharing about, you know, how you can do it, what you, what you can do and everything. And, um, and uh, he called it the golden mic. His name is Michael Mike and he, you know, Mike M-I-C, right? So he was being, you know, clever and what, as a little kid. And I just, I thought, okay, I was a little bit nervous, but I, but I prayed about it and I felt good about it. And my husband completely supported. He said, he's going to learn so much from this. And, and it, it, he grew in confidence and ability and everything. And now he's the one who does my editing for the, the um, recordings. He has, I'm in his room, right? So he has this whole setup here. He built the desk here that all of this is on and he's got his computer set up. Um, and normally I wouldn't allow a computer in a room but this is a total, this is his recording studio. And he has a MIDI keyboard and he has all these other instruments and he lays down tracks of music and he's been writing stuff and, um, and it's super cool. And then he, so he has his instruments, he has the things he loves all surrounding him here. He got interested just lately in um, soldering. So he's got a little desk he built on the wall that folds down and up and he's got all of his soldering stuff over there. And then he, I told you he has this interest in woodworking and he's been doing that. And then he built for his dad this whole, um, I think I shared that before, but a, oh, what is it, arcade game set up kind of thing you know like you know the arcade games you can buy for like a ton of money that are the ones that stand in the arcade but it's got all the games loaded on it or you know something like that well he built this little just little riser kind of a setup and on top of it are all the arcade buttons and the trigger and the spinner and like all the things if you grew up in the 80s sorry that's what we did on dates <laughs> so we went to the arcade anyway um but it has all of those things on it. And then underneath are all the components and how everything is hooked together and an old laptop that he took apart and linked to it all. And you just hook it up to the TV and he's downloaded all these old vintage games and we can play all these games. But he built and created the whole thing, you know? So, and it was his dad's Christmas present. Anyway, just super fun. And he pursues his interests. And that's what your kids can do if you let them. If you create this warm environment, you are learning, you're doing your hobbies, you're in, involved in these things where you can and how you can. There are so many different limitations, different situations for each one of us. So please don't hear the voice of all the limitations. Don't do that to yourself open up and think, okay, there's got to be a way for me to be able to figure this out. There's got to be a way, some little tiny avenue, some little outlet that I can find to bring in something that brings me joy, something that warms my heart, something that I love and can be feel passionate about that I can share with my children. And we can have these experiences together. If you can't think of them, that's okay. That's totally normal. Ask Heavenly Father, ask for help ask for direction. How can I find this in my life and bring this into my family's lives? And, and he will bring it to you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm talking so much today. I feel bad about that. I feel like I'm um, overshadowed. Lori, yes. I'd like to, I'd like to go off on that. I, I know exactly what you mean by that. You know, I've always wanted to learn how to play the piano, been so jealous. And my girls had just started playing, um, learning from my niece, my cute little niece, who teaches us 30 minutes for 10, for 10 bucks. Right. And so finally I just said, you know, I think I want to learn. And I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I'm adding more to my plate. Like how much more can I add to my plate? Right. But my friend said to me, she said, well, what's five minutes. Cause I said, I don't have time to practice. I, what, what was I thinking, you know, doing all of that. And she just said, five minutes. You don't have five minutes to go downstairs, put a timer on and just go practice. And just the way she said that to me, I guess was like, I guess I have five minutes. 
you know, and to, to, and the kids have been seeing it and they make them smile and then it gets them practicing. And, and it's something for me, because I know when the kid, well, and all the kids are gone, I'm going to, you know, it'll yeah. give me, I hate to say it, maybe something to do, you know, to, to sit down and play for a minute. So, but uh, yeah, just to go off of kind of what you were saying, just uh, being an example and, and just doing something you've been wanting to do. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. I appreciate that. And Kristen, you came on. Did you want to say something? Are you still close? And then we'll go to yeah, Kate. I'm here. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple of things. For one, I think especially some, if there are other moms who, and it's not just as a mom, I'm more of a, I like to be in control of things. I like to know and have control. And so, um, so a couple of things about that, and maybe nobody else is like me. And so this doesn't apply, but in just in case, um, for one, it's easy to look at Michael, who's now an adult and say, but I'm not seeing any signs of my children doing that. I'm not seeing that, that anything like that is going to happen with them. And it's easy to um, backtrack a little bit or say, I'm, um, I'm not, I, 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 I need to push them a little bit in one direction or another, you know? And, um, and for one thing, maybe everybody isn't going to get to the point that Michael is where he's that self-motivated to make all these things and do all, you know? Um, but if you have a child who just really is pursuing reading, you, it'll, it will come out in all the things that they are learning and, um, and that's, that's great. I mean, you'll, you'll, in conversations, you'll, you'll have conversations with them and they will say things and you'll say, how did you know that? I mean, I, that just happened to me three or four times this week where one of my children has said something, how did you know that? Oh, I read about it and said, da, da, you know, or, or I saw a YouTube video about it. I mean, that's another thing that they, um, that we let them do within limits and they, they learn things. And so, so you're talking about you're addressing like you want, you don't necessarily see anything coming out right. of it yet. Yeah, yeah. So some children you might see that they sit and they start composing their own music or they start building these things on their own or, but but others you're not necessarily going to see it. One other thing that I want to that I've been thinking a lot about is, and we've talked about this a little bit, but not viewing ourselves like Lori even was talking about this today that Satan has he wants to view us in this certain way but one of the things that I think happens with that and that he tries to do is he shows us these personality traits that we have as and shows us that that trait is a negative thing instead of if we could see that I have this particular per, uh, personality trait and like I, I'll go with the control freak thing because I kind of am and so I could see that as a negative thing, but I can also look at it. And this is what I'm trying to learn to do with myself and give myself grace and, and see, okay, what is the control freak? That is not the actual personality trait. That's one of the ways that it's manifest. Right. But, but it is because I like order, although you might not be able to always, it's like if I showed you my sewing room right now, you would not believe that. <laughs> um, but, but different things about my life that are all from this same basic trait, which I'm not even exactly sure what it is, honestly. Um, but I, I need to learn to use those to help my family. And so one person might be really great at saying, we can just let go. And that might be their talent that they don't have to always, they're, they can be more spontaneous maybe and those kinds of things. And that's great. And I'm trying to learn to be more like that, but also my abilities to organize things and those things are good for my children too. And so I can use that talent that I have with my family to bless them. Maybe nobody else needs to hear that. Maybe I just need to hear that myself again. Oh, I did just post it in the comments. I love that, Kristen. I've been thinking about that too in regards to myself. So there you go. 
And so, so because of that, you know, if, if Lori and I were next door neighbors, which we never have been, we've never even lived in the same state as each other, which we would love. And our children, our older children are the best of friends and love each other. And in fact, my little children and Lori's older children are the best of friends too. But, but if we were to homeschool side by side, it would not look the same. Mm -mm. And that is okay. And, and our so, kids wouldn't come out doing the same things at all. No, no. And, and Lori's way of handling things would be different than my way of handling things. I'm, I like to have a schedule. And if I don't have a schedule, then for me, as the mom, I feel, I just start feeling completely lost and like, I can't, and I have to have a schedule, but you know what? So now my children are learning that from me and I don't need, and, and I've learned not to overschedule them and to fit things in, in ways that work for them and that they have, they have their own control, but within a schedule for our family. And I'm not just talking school here. I'm talking about life. Yeah. But other people feel like, I, I feel like I never get anything. I, I always am not getting to the things I need to do if I don't have a schedule, but if I have a schedule, then I can make a decision. We're not going to do that today. And I feel okay about that. Anyway, I hope all this makes sense, but I feel like other people are able to just go throughout their day and know in their head, the things that need to get done and they, they'll do it. And, you know, so we all have different ways and, and we can, we need to not feel like, well, I'm not doing the way somebody else is. So I must be doing it wrong. Yeah. That's right. It. Right. I'm done. No, no, you're, that's wonderful. And I need to make sure that I insert something here. When I share an example, like with one of my kids, I'm sharing you one example, one situation of something that happened and my, and I'm never as clear as I mean to be. I go back, like when I'm listening, I think, oh, I should have said that. Or I, you know, I left this whole point out, which makes it, would have made it clear. But my point is that each child is so different and you don't know, you don't know, and you don't have to worry so much. You need to, to learn to um, create that wonderful environment, do those things you feel um, that you feel inspired to do for your family and then trust, trust and let go. For me, for that kid, it was, I could have directed everything and I would never have steered him in the direction where he ended up and where he's been successful and, you know, and is feeling so good about himself. And that's kind of more my point was sometimes the, you, you do enough and then you just need to stand back and watch, you know, watch them bloom. And some of them will be quiet little bloomers you know, and they'll be doing wonderful, amazing things, but it'll be in a very quiet way and not a showy way and not something that you even can show, look what this child did, you know, and others will do the, all this stuff that you see, you know, but it's very different. It's just different for each child. And when we've seen the public school model for so long, it's hard not to keep that kind of box in mind and, and to let go of that and let them each be who they are you know, who are they supposed to be? Anyway, sorry, Cadence, you had a comment and then um, Ida. Yes, um, when, you, when she was talking about playing the piano and wanting to learn. So I took probably six months of piano lesson when I was 14 years old and that was all we could do. But ever since then, and I don't even know how many years that's been, anyway, a lot of years, uh, but I never stopped playing just a little bit I, I wanted to play I wanted to, to come easily to sound beautiful and this week I just realized when I was playing out of the children's songbook that it was coming easily mm. not every song but I could make beautiful music and the song was new to me because I was making it I was making the music and I hadn't practiced every day for an hour or whatever, maybe not even five minutes a day. But over the years, that little bit of keeping it going in that interest has just bloomed into this beautiful flower. And I'm just so grateful for it. Anyway, I didn't mean to cry. But we never, um, we never mean to cry, but <laughs> it just comes out. But so I just wanted to share that. And I actually have to go, but. Thank you so much, everyone. I love this meeting and I love all of you. So thank you for sharing. I love that so much. Okay, Ida, we can't hear you. Push your little button. 
Dang it. <laughs> oh, I just missed Cadence. I was going to ask her a question. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's fine. I loved what Kristen shared. Thank you for sharing that, Kristen, because I needed to hear that. <laughs> you guys are all sharing great things. I was so busy helping somebody move, and now I'm just back home now. So anyways, but I wanted to say, um, I was thinking when you were talking, giving your example, that my son, who's 12, he's like, and my 10-year-old, they're like into a million different things, but it's like not like consistent. It's like they hop around all the time. Like he loves to build things and he loves animals and all things about animals or whatever, anything with legs that moves and is alive. <laughs> Maybe not legs actually, snakes he likes. <laughs> and and then they are like super, um, they want to learn everything about hunting. And so they're trying to get their hunter safety license and so they've been taking this class and had to go through and like take all these quizzes on the um, NRI's website and I'm thinking to myself so my kids are going to grow up to be what exactly <laughs> but I know that it's, it's a process and and also for myself like what she was talking about her her you know quality that she feels like sometimes she looks at it in a negative light and I think that's Satan's trick. Like we can say I'm goal oriented or you can say I'm a control freak, <laughs> right? Like how we put, how we say that, like Satan wants us to say the thing the neg in the negative way. And yes, it can become negative. You know, like every virtue can become a vice if we're not trying, you know, working on it. But I was thinking that about myself. Like I am, I'm kind of a, I'm super like an artist and I'm all over the place all the time. <laughs> And I am, I like my husband and I've moved like every two years for the last, I don't know, since we've been married. <laughs> and people think that's crazy, but I'm always like, yeah, you're going to go to a new place. It's going to be so exciting, a new adventure. And I, I was listening to um, the Norps, you know, uh -huh. and she was saying like, she's feels like she's kind of like always, you know, on an adventure too. And that really resonated with me. And she's like, and I had to give myself grace because sometimes I feel like I'm just all over the place all the time. But maybe there's, maybe there's something to that. Like, I mean, like Heavenly Father maybe created me in this way. And maybe that's, and, and sometimes it's hard to see what, what's the positive spin on that. <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, Megan Norp, yeah. Anyways, but I think that it's really um, recognizing our strengths. So like for me, maybe I love adventure and i and i like my kids kind of i think are learning that from me too like they love to do things and see things and explore and maybe that's maybe that's why i'm the way i am i don't know maybe <laughs> usually Emily father has lots of reasons i think but so thanks for those great thoughts kristen that was like also like things that have been going through my head another thing <clears throat> sorry <laughs> i was think i've been thinking like what lindsay said earlier about getting it into you instead of worrying about just reading through it i feel like i have a hard time remembering things like i will read uh, books and i'm like oh, i love this book so much this is so awesome and then like i'll try to tell people about it and i cannot remember any of the details and i'm like oh you know and like i was telling my brother-in-law about the snow queen and trying to explain that story and how cool it was and i read this one version and then i read this other version and how different they were and how much was taken out of this newer version of that story that was so good and full of light you know and so i was trying to express that to him Anyways, my son sitting next to me, he's like, mom, that's not what happened. This is what happened. And he's like, <laughs> I'm like, well, at least somebody got something from the story. <laughs> so I don't know, like, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's something I need to work on. Does other people struggle with that? Like, I'll read a book. Maybe I have to just read it like a hundred times before <laughs> like it gets in there. Uh, so I don't know. Do you guys have tips, tricks? Maybe part of the process is telling people, like teaching it, like maybe i don't know so i guess my question yeah well you know what what does um what does marlene have tell us to do you know we have a notebook and we write down and we make notes when i do that the stuff is in there and then i go and tell people about it because that's another part of it you know you're you're narrating it you're telling it back to somebody else once you do that well you know they tell you once you can teach a concept to a is it a six-year-old or something like that then you have assimilated it and you have it. It's yours now, you know. Sorry, I look around my camera. That's what I'm doing. 
to see. I'm trying to see Linnell because she moved. I was like, oh, is Linnell going to say something? Peggy's looking like, oh, I, this is something I want to mention. I want to bring this up because I, while we still have mamas here, um, I don't know how many of you know Peggy. Peggy, are you okay sharing for just a moment um, so that there's time for moms to respond to you, what your current situation is, and how you might be a little more limited than us in finding ways to warm your heart and your children's? Is that okay to bring that up? Uh, sure. Um, so we moved after many moves, just like um Ida <laughs> with military we finally stopped moving and one of the reasons we needed to stop moving is because we have a, a daughter who is highly dependent and uses a wheelchair full-time so I'm you know I'm already in this crazy niche I'm going to interrupt you just for a sec she yeah. has a daughter who has a disease named after her so yeah so it's kind yeah. of so her name is Esra Edwards and so it's called the double e deletion and it was discovered at Boston Children's. And so we go to, we do all of her care there, no matter where we've been stationed, we fly there. And so, um, bye, bye. Um, we, uh, so now we're here settled in our hopefully forever home. And um, we, we had to find a place where we could be settled for her because living in a two-dimensional world is so challenging. And um, so we, we're already homeschoolers, so we're already weird. And then we have a special needs child and that's very ex excluding because we can't go to people's houses. So to try and create a, a warm and um, inclusive atmosphere has taken a lot of intentionality on our part. Years and years of planning to get to a place where um, processes and rituals and routines are inclusive for everyone and it's um it takes a lot of heart space literal heart space and a lot of prayer and a lot of patience and but here we are and um we've been here about 18 months and we finally unpacked our last box this month yay <laughs> and um because all of my box my books were in boxes like that was the last thing we didn't have enough bookcases and so my husband, bless his heart, he drove to Salt Lake City and bought, went to Ikea and bought five more bookcases. So now our library is complete. Cause I don't know, I, I think I'm in the right place when I say like my bookcases are my brain. Like if I don't have order, I can't, I have this idea. I go, oh yeah. And I couldn't find that one book cause it was buried in these boxes. And um, so anyway, it's, it's been a, it's been a journey. And so trying to, find ways to engage this soul that cannot hear me well. She has vision impairment. She's missing her middle brain. Um, she has the other neurological challenges. And, um, and then you add the whole physical realm of like nature study is really challenging. Like I, I let's, we're gonna do pond study this week but I can't go to a pond because I can't get my wheelchair there. How do we do that? Here in the house, we watch a ton of YouTube. YouTube is our best friend. I mean, I just, I like, just like uh, Ida, you said about Megan Norp, right? Like giving yourself grace. Like we're just giving ourselves grace and embracing technology and all of its amazing things. Um, one thing that I haven't done is stepped over the line to virtual reality. I've decided that that is just too much for her brain and I don't want to change other people's brains in my home. And so we embrace YouTube, we embrace um, the dramatized history that we find on Amazon or wherever. And um, so that visual impact is there, but I don't think I could ever do virtual reality because it's so immersive. And I think it, it just, it creates such a expectation of experience um, I have to just kind of keep expectations low, right? And um, so anyway, so that's kind of where we are. So we live here in a home that we're working on making accessible for her. And we just finished doing a little apartment for her. She has her own little bathroom and bedroom. But I mean, imagine, I mean, you're in a chair, you can't wash your hands because you can't reach the sink. So that, I mean, just 
hygiene generally like is a challenge and so we're making it so she can reach her sink and brush her teeth and be part of her own realm and not have it she didn't brush her teeth by herself until she you know even like even in the last year because she didn't have a sink she could reach so all those things so right it's it's that maslow's hierarchy we we have been at the survival bottom for so long and now how can we reach to self-actualization yeah. within our physical realm? And so like, I love your, um, your mentoring space, your, your dining room turned book room, Lori, because right, that's, that's a, a physical manifestation of the goals that you're seeking inside of you. And so that's to be able to physically manifest your space, however that is, like you were saying, Lori, books or whether you like hiking or outdoor tools or, who knows, musical instruments, right? You're manifesting your space to become the person that you wanna be. And so that's that's our been our goal. And I think being able to share, like having this group has been so great because I haven't been able to find like-minded people because I'm here in my physical space with my special needs child. I can't leave, can't bring her with me. So here I am, I'm embracing technology and um, unashamed that we are here in this this realm that we've created and God has made it possible. I remember President Hinckley, he was saying like all the amazing things that have come to, to furnish and forward the gathering, planes and satellites and telephones. I mean, just those things, not even the internet, not even mobile phones, not even texting, like just his view of that, those things right then, how miraculous we are and how miraculous our time is that we can be tied together in this moment with these tools that help us. Uh, I heard someone who he said, um, I don't know, it was just, he was talking about some sort of tool. I don't, maybe it was a phone. It's like the, the phone, you know, talking about people being addicted and having challenges and having boundaries with their devices. He's like, this has, this is a neutral thing, this little screen. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it and you have to choose. I think it was Russell Brand. I don't know how I found him. And he's, I mean, he has been an amazing voice lately just in being very present and understanding what's going on in the world. And so that was really cool to hear him say that. So is that what you wanted me to say, Lori? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I wanted these other moms to meet you and to know, cause you and I have talked afterwards and I think Lindsay's been part of that conversation and she's having internet issues. She keeps getting kicked off, but. Um, but none of the other moms knew your story, you know, and I think I love learning more about each other and learning our stories and it helps us become more connected. Also, we can think of ideas that might be helpful for one another. Um, and I think just having for you too, uh, having others know your story, I think that's significant and, and really does um, create those connections. So. Well, thank you. I just, I actually just wanted to share something about Abraham Lincoln really fast before okay. people go off. So um, we moved from Washington, DC. And so Ford's Theater is there. And that is an amazing resource. So I, I want to share my screen. Is that okay, Lori? Mm -hmm. Can I do that? Okay. Let me, I've got to, um, I have to do something. Look at me learning how to do stuff. Are you guys impressed? You're impressed, right? You just make her a co-host and then she can share her screen. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, so do I press the share screen button? Mm -hmm. Is that what I do? Um, okay. All right, can everyone see that? Good job. Okay, so this is the Ford's Theater website. And so um, they've closed due to COVID, it seems. Um, so they're doing, they have these virtual tours and I thought this was really neat. Um, so not only do they focus on the last part of Lincoln's life and political things, all that, but you can actually do a Google tour. And so I wanted to, let's see, is this it? No, sorry. Oh, okay. Is it? uh okay yeah just you're you're on the screen yeah there you go okay virtual tour so they said they partnered with google arts and culture to create a virtual tour of ford's theater so this i just love these things right because we can just plug in and everyone like this is great no barriers and 
they'll take you through and they just have the camera panning around and you can see and I thought that was really cool and they take show gives you a little bit at the bottom here about the time and day when uh, Lincoln was coming and how they decorated so I just thought this was a neat resource for you it's um, Fords.org and so my daughter was reminding me that in the lobby of the Fords Theater um, oops sorry that wasn't what I wanted um, in the lobby of the Fords Theater there's a stack of books and it's about 50 feet high I, I can turn my screen share off now um, stop share um, it's about 50 feet high and it's um, a representation of the 15,000 books that have been written about Abraham Lincoln. Wow. She said it was immense. And um, I've, I mean, I, so the way my life is, I mean, someone, we don't always go out in public with our daughter. So um, it's so we can take other people. And so they went, but they said it was massive, this huge, they put them in a circle and they went way up and so just there's just volumes and volumes of literature out there and um so i thought that was just really neat to know that there's some great resources out there for us digitally and so i just wanted to share okay i'm just typing something here because i've just given you a job <laughs> i'm naming v peggy as our official virtual resource specialist <laughs> <laughs> because that's something that you're putting in your life every day for you to be able to to live your life right that's the part of what you're manifesting in your personal space and because we haven't had to do that we don't even know about a lot of those resources that we could use in our own homes and in our own learning experiences so See, we all learn from each other. We all gain so much from one another. And if we hadn't reached out, if we hadn't shown up today, we wouldn't have made the connections we made. We wouldn't have learned the things that we have learned. Now, Linnell, are you ready to do your part? <laughs> I'm naming, I've named Linnell as our official um, summary specialist. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. I've got thoughts. I've got lots of them. I'll try to keep them concise and give them to you in a way that makes sense. I think one of the most beautiful things about this group is to be able to connect and experience diversity in real meaningful ways and to associate with people with different life experiences and different passions, different challenges, different strengths. And I'll share one of the things that I've experienced in this meeting. I've kind of felt like I don't fit into a discussion about books because I'm so brand new with books. Mm -hmm. So many of the resources that are offered, I have no idea. I've never heard of them. I have a very small personal library, it basically started out with Marlene's. And this past week, my brother sent me a podcast. He knows I played the saxophone in high school. And so I know Kenny G, who is a very famous saxophonist, and Kenny G apparently is a pilot. And I learned that from my brother because he's into aviation. And so he found this podcast and one of the guests on this podcast about aviation was Kenny G. So he sent it over to me and said, I thought maybe you'd be interested. Did you know he's a pilot? And I had no idea. And he did tell me you probably won't understand because there's a lot of aviation lingo, but try it out. So I listened to this and I had no idea what they were talking about. And I felt completely out of place because I don't know anything about aviation. But I had one connection with Kenny G that I play the saxophone. And then it opened my world to this new experience. And I was able to learn truth and receive enrichment from his experience in aviation, even though I didn't understand a lot of the vocabulary he was using. And I think the same thing happened for me today where I don't know many of these books, but I see the potential that I have, that I can create a home library and I can enrich my life and my children's lives. And I can learn so much because I'm associated with you and because you share your experiences with me. And I've been thinking a lot about how comparison comparisons and comparing kind of gets a bad rap. Like we think you shouldn't compare and it's bad to compare. And when you compare, you feel down. But 
sometimes, and especially this week, I've been comparing myself and I've been uplifted by that. For example, my son has been learning to cook and that's because, not because I taught him, it's because, well, I did teach him, but it's not because I wanted to teach him, it's because I saw another friend's son cooking and I was like, oh, if he can do that, then my son can do that. And so I taught him to cook. I never would have done that otherwise. Mm -hmm. Another example is learning to ride a bike. Another kid can ride a bike and my kid can't. Oh, well, if he can do that, then I can do that. And so I think when we compare in a way that inspires us, mm -hmm. when we compare in a way that invites us to improve our lives, it can be a really good thing. And so many times I come away from our group meetings where I've compared myself to you and your lives and your examples. And I want to be like you. I want to try that. I want to remember that. I want to do that. And so that's the beauty of Mothers of Influence. That's the beauty of sharing your lives and connecting on a deeper level because we can inspire and uplift and bless each other. And one of the things that Kristen shared that I will take away this week is her perspective she shared on that one information she learned, that one piece of information she learned that helped her understand Mary Todd. Is that her name? Uh -huh. I don't, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the things that I don't, I'm not familiar with her and I don't know anything about her, but it was inspiring to learn about the stories. And so when she was talking about how learning about migraines helped her to see maybe a different explanation for what was going on in this family's life, that really opened my mind to how we in our day sometimes are critical of others, sometimes judge other people's actions when we don't know the behind story. And so if we can take a little bit of our own experience, put ourselves in the shoes, think about, well, why could this be happening to them? I think it can really be a blessing in our lives. And so as we learn about people and learn their stories and listen to their experiences and open our hearts to them, then we can create a beautiful, a beautiful experience, a beautiful relationship, a beautiful life. So I will remember that this week. I will try to be open to others um, in my learning. And what I've been doing in my schooling with my son is we've been focusing on Africa. We haven't even touched Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing some African music and some African stories and oh, a whole bunch of Africa in our studies. And that's been enriching and fulfilling for me. And so going back to what Lori was talking about, where we need to learn for ourselves is that I, in my entire life, have never taken the time to learn about Africa. I know nothing about Africa. And so this past week, I watched some videos about it. And I was excited to tell my husband about the things that I was learning. And I get to pass that knowledge and the opportunity onto my children. So it's such a wonderful thing to learn for ourselves, to pass that on to our children, to learn from each other, and to allow diversity to be a blessing in our lives. I love it. Thank you. You are so good at that. That is such a gift that you have. Thanks for being willing to do that. I'm excited. I'm excited about all the wonderful things that we're going to get to learn about this month as we pursue that list for this month. If you're following the rotation is wonderful. So as we continue, we can talk about these things. Uh, we have um, African Americans and slavery, Africa, ancient Egypt, animals, and then the whole over overarching subject of history. So those are things that are on the rotation and there are wonderful resources for each one of those areas, even the listening library, the stories and things that go along with each of those different things. It's just such a wealth of information that's just right there for us to have access to. So, and thank you, Peggy, that New World Symphony. I love, I love that. Oh, and the Frank language, oh, French language. So okay. I just wanted to share. So in this little link, someone plays this song so the the french hymn book um they someone wrote words to it and so he has translated the french yeah. loosely into english and it's the most beautiful song and um we one of our children passed away and this is the song we we played for her and it is such it is such a touching song so i'm glad you brought it up i i can't wait to listen to the piano guys Stephen Sharp Nelson one. Yes, wonderful. Thanks for sharing this. How sweet and how tender. It sounds like just the perfect, 
Perfect. Well, just one more thing. So you were talking about uh, books. I just wanted to recommend one book we started yesterday in the rotation. It's from the Sowers series. I'll type that in. Uh, the Sowers. And it's George Washington Carver. It is so good. Oh. oh my goodness. I was ignoring my children all evening. I'm like, go away. Stop. And then finally halfway through, I said, okay, I'll read it out loud to you. I'll start it over again. And yeah. they, it was so sweet. And it's just, it's so full of testimony and faith and such a journey. I mean, you, you see such surface in, in history and in culture being portrayed of people in, you know, Black History Month or yeah. trying to jam so many things into a small amount of time. But this book is so gentle and so loving and portrays him as a little boy growing and his journey. And so I am excited to discover the Sower series and um, I think they have several more people that we're, we'll be interested in learning about in this month with the topics of African Americans and Africa and all that and slavery. So wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for sharing that recommendation. There's just so much good out there. So go out, uh, go somewhere, go hide, <laughs> take some books and learn what you can. Learn what you can in the next week and, and we'll share that next Friday. We'll talk about the things that we're learning, the things that we have come up with, you know, the things that have just kind of dropped in front of us and we've been able to take advantage of or the things that maybe we've been brave enough to try. So, and then we'll talk about that next Friday. Thank you all so, so much. It's been lovely, lovely chatting with you as always. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.